series is called Voices. We're surrounded by them. They're all over the place, and all too often we don't even bother to really think and pay attention to what we're listening to. But what are the voices you listen to? What are the voices that you give the authority to, to shape your thoughts and your words and your life? That's the point of this series, is that we start thinking about what goes in because what goes in not only comes out, but it shapes who and what we are. It shapes how we live. It shapes everything about us. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. We're, we're going to talk about a guy named Elijah. And Elijah is a little bit of a challenge for me to understand. On one hand, he is like the superhero old guy of the Old Testament. His life is like one huge adventure. He's the kind of guy that they make movies about. Then on the other hand, he seems to be the polar opposite of a superhero. He seems to be the very worst of me when I'm at my very worst. Elijah literally changes the course of his life because someone basically says boo too loud in his direction. And I think by the time we're done with this one, you, like me, are going to see something of yourself in him. Elijah was a prophet in some of the best days in the history of Israel and some of the worst days of Israel's history. Elijah heard and he knew the voice of God, and there was a long time in his life when he was obedient to it. Then another voice made his way into, its, into his head, an entirely different voice, and it changed the trajectory of his life in a way that he could never recover from. It changed because he gave in to that new voice. He gave that voice authority. He gave it power that it didn't actually have, and he listened to the voice of the enemy of God rather than to the voice of God. And that's important because that's the thing that you and I have to make decisions about every single day. We've got to decide if we're going to listen to the voice of God or if we're going to listen to the voice of the world and the enemy of God. And just like with us, what God allowed him to do was to fill his brain with fear and allowed him to go on the course, the trajectory that he wanted to go. We find Elijah's life recorded in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. If you've got your Bible, flip to 1 Kings. We're going to start in the 17th chapter. There's some really rich stuff going on in the book of Kings. I say rich because one of the guys that's in there that's got a very prominent role is a guy named Solomon, King Solomon, wealthiest guy ever. I mean, incredible amount of money. His queen named Queen of Sheba, it talks about how Solomon strayed from God, how the kingdom of, the Israel, of Israel was divided and how it eventually Ahab became the king of Israel. And Ahab was married to a woman named Jezebel, and she was not a very nice woman. Things aren't going well for Israel at this time because Israel is suffering from bad leadership. People that have taken them away from God, the nation is divided, and they've got an evil king and a more evil queen. And they aren't living in a way that is God-honoring. And Israel finds itself where it is at the precipice of being one generation away from completely forgetting about God altogether, not entirely unlike America. If we're not the voice that speaks the truth of God into our world, where in the world do you think our kids are going to hear about him? If it doesn't come from us, they're not going to know God. So God raises up a man named Elijah and I would add, and so God raises up men and women like you to speak his truth as well. And so Elijah's first act really is he, he calls a drought on the land. Now they're living out in the desert, right? You got to understand that. First of all, there's not a whole lot of anything going on, but he calls a drought and, and the drought comes. And that's going to become a very important factor as this passage goes on. Their land is drying up because the faith has dried up. They're already in the desert, and so we're talking dry that is really dry. But the people's faith is even more dry. He's a prophet who is called to speak for God. And it's important that we, when we look to the Old Testament, to Jesus' transfiguration, there was two other characters from the Old Testament who were present there. There was two other men who were introduced in the Old Testament books who were present, Moses and Elijah. Elijah is a big deal. To, to the Jewish people, he is the greatest prophet of all of them. So picking up the passage in 1 Kings 17th chapter, starting the second verse. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, 
Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, and he did according to the word of the Lord. God provides a command, direction, and provision. And wouldn't you know it, because Elijah was obedient to God, the ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening. God honored his word. What's interesting about that is what is a raven going to eat? It's going to eat bread if it can find it and meat everywhere that it can. And yet it, they brought their meal to Elijah to sustain him because God told him that he would provide for him. And God honored his word. So God and Elijah, they continue to have conversations. And, and Elijah begins to be obedient and he grows in his obedience and he and God are developing this really good trusting relationship because God always follows through and does exactly what he says and so at one point at God's command he goes out of his way and he goes to a widow whose son has died and he raises the woman, widow's son from the dead God shows up in a big way then things start to get really interesting because God tells Elijah I want you to go and present yourself to King Ahab and Elijah probably went, oh no, not that guy. But Elijah does what he's told. And he goes to King Ahab, and that's when things start really getting interesting here. See, those two go back and forth, and they start taunting each other and talking about, you know, who's better. And, and Ahab thinks Elijah's just a troublemaker, and Elijah thinks that Ahab, he knows he's a troublemaker. And then they start talking about which God is real, and who should they listen to, and who should they follow. Ahab's taking the people of God away from God. Elijah's trying to bring them back, and they say, it's time to solve this once and for all. Let's just take care of this once and for all. So they agree that they're going to have a showdown. Prize fight, if you will, between Elijah on God's side and King Ahab and his prophets of Baal, all 450 of them, and the 400 prophets of Asherah that the Bible says eats with his, eat with his wife Jezebel. And they all agree that this event is going to happen on the top of Mount Carmel. That way everybody can come and see it. It's going to be a high point of all the land. It's going to be a big deal. As a side note, the folks that are going to be going to the Holy Land in a few weeks are going to stand on top of Mount Carmel, and they're going to look down the Jezreel Valley. And so if you read this passage in the Bible, you're going to read more about both of those. Still a real place. It existed then, and it exists today. So put this into today's world. What is this? This is a big dollar, big dollar prize fight if it was boxers this would be a live pay-per-view event like they do with the biggest fights the two sides they agree on the rules and the rules are this both sides are going to build an altar one at a time they're going to put the wood down they're going to take a bowl they're going to slaughter the bowl they're going to cut it in pieces they're going to put it on top of the altar and then the prophets of baal are going to call for baal to send fire down from the sky to light the altar and to accept the sacrifice. And Elijah, in turn, is going to call down from God and ask God to send fire to light the altar and accept the sacrifice. But they can't light it. That's, that's the thing. They can't actually strike anything that causes the wood to burn. So that's going to be the one who what decides who's the true God. Whatever God can send fire, that's the one that they're going to follow. So Ahab, see, he figures they, this is a lockdown piece of cake because they believe Baal, among other things, sends the weather. As a side note, they're in the midst of a long drought. If Baal cared so much about them and he sends the weather, you'd think he would have sent rain. But we're not talking about that. Ahab thinks, this is perfect. This is custom made for a quick and easy knockout fight. We're going to take care of this because Baal sends rain he sends thunderstorms, he sends clouds, he sends sunshine, he sends lightning. What they need is a good dose of lightning. So the rules are agreed, and, and Ahab's guys, they go first, because they figured this is going to be quick and easy, custom-tailored victory. So Elijah, Elijah stands back, and he lets Ahab's guys go to, work, go to work. So they build an altar out of wood, and they kill a bull, and they cut it in pieces, and they put the bull on top of the altar which is what everybody did for a sacrifice, right? And then they stand back, and now they, they can't light it. So they start calling on Baal to send fire, and they start dancing and chanting and pleading and begging, and the Bible says that as they go on, they start slashing themselves and cutting themselves as though a little bit of blood sacrifice on their part is going to get Baal's attention, and it's probably 100 degrees, and they're in the middle of the desert, and they're wearing long wool robes, and they're bleeding out in front of the altar. Of course, they're starting to go a little bit loony, so it says they start wailing, but nothing. 
And Elijah, being the non-confrontational guy he is, starts to taunt and tease him. So where's your bail? Is he too busy? Why isn't he coming to help you? If he's there, this is an easy thing for him. He actually makes the statement in the Hebrew. He actually says, maybe he's out on the toilet and he doesn't want you to bother him. <laughs> they continue and they continue and they continue. Crickets. Nothing. Baal doesn't send so much as a spark. With a little bit of modern wordplay, I think it's fun to think about the fact that Baal rhymes with fail, which is exactly what happened. Their time was over. Next up's Elijah. Baal never showed up. There wasn't so much as a spark to light the wood. So Elijah goes to work. Now he's on his own, right? So he prepares the ground and he starts completely from scratch. He's not using the same altar. He creates a whole new altar because God deserves an altar that's holy that hasn't been used for anything else, especially a small g God sacrifice, which didn't go anywhere anyway. So Elijah builds a new altar with new wood. He kills the bull. He cuts it into pieces. He lays it on the top. He takes 12 stones and he lines around or rings the altar with 12 stones to use this as an opportunity to remind the people that they've descended from the 12 tribes of Israel. Remind them who they really are, that God is their God, and that they've accepted Baal, but Baal isn't their God. Baal isn't even real. He's just shown that to him for himself. And then he has them dig a trench around the whole thing. And now they're in the middle of the desert, they're on the top of a mountain, they're in the middle of a drought, and he says, I want you to get these three big pitch, um, uh, canisters, and I want you to fill them with water, and I want you to pour it over the bowl and over the wood and over the altar. And so they dump all this water on top of it because he wants to make the statement that this God is a God of abundance, that he actually controls the water. Water isn't in short supply for God. And then he says, do it again, and they do it again. And then he says, do it a third time. They do it a third time. The bowl is soaking wet. The wood is soaking wet. So much water, in fact, that the entire trench around the altar is full of water. And what he's trying to do is to make the statement to them that there's no question in the word, world when this altar starts on fire, there's no question that it is the God of Israel who set the fire. And then instead of chanting, chanting and dancing and wailing and cutting himself, Elijah does something very simple. He prays. Here's his prayer. He said, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. He's already praying in the future tense that you're the one God who brought them back to you. It wasn't anything they did. It was what you did. Elijah knows this is over before it begins. A simple prayer directing all the reason, the purpose, the action, the authority directly back to God where it belongs. Guess what happened? It says fire fell from the sky. Fire that completely consumed the bull accepted the sacrifice completely consumed the wood but the fire didn't stop there it said the fire consumed the stones it consumed the ground it consumed the water in the trench and it even took up the dust that was on the ground there was nothing left where there had been an altar before so, yeah you can clap about that so you've got these 850 prophets of false small g gods who did their very best to get fire to start somehow or another, and there was nothing but the sound of crickets. And Elijah simply says a prayer and says, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for your people. And not only does God accept the, the sacrifice, but he consumes the altar, the stones, the ground, the dust, and the water. He takes it all. And what the people are left with is just an empty place. Fire fell from heaven and took everything that had been there. God answered Elijah's prayer because Elijah had been faithful and obedient to the truth and to the voice of God. He was exactly where God told him to be. And he said, God, this isn't about me. This is about you. And then Elijah told the people to do something kind of strange to our ears, but it's awfully important to the message that we need to get out of this. He said, seize the prophets. The very same people who used to worship him said, seize the prophets of Baal and take them to the valley below and kill them. And so they took the 400 prophets of Baal and they marched them down to the river and they killed them all. And that seems like such a drastic thing. Why in the world would he needed to have done that? I'll tell you why. Because the people had followed the wrong voice for too long and he said, I'm taking the wrong voice away. There's no room 
in the heart or the mind of a believer in God for any of the other religious garbage that's out in the world. Other spiritual junk only leads us away from the voice of truth that is God and his word to us. And Elijah realized how serious those voices were and what they really stood for. They stood for the lies of the enemy of God. They stood for lies that kept people away from a relationship with God. And they were nothing but spiritual trash that led to death for the people of God. And so Elijah said, the voices need to go. He took captive their thoughts for them. Question is this, do you take the voices in your head that seriously? Do you take the thoughts and images and ideas and the things that people say that are not God-honoring, and do you take them so seriously that you put them to death? Not the people, the thoughts. Do you take and put them to death? Do you take captive those thoughts so that you don't even give them any mind space? Because that's what Elijah is doing here. But see, the thing that's happened in America is we say, well, we can have it both ways. And, and you know, we think we can dabble in other spiritualities and, and dip our toes and our minds into other religious practices. And so I've gotten myself in trouble with this before, and so I'm going to do it again today. So here we go. Are you ready? Here's one of the most pervasive in Christian circles in America. It's yoga. It's just exercise, you say. I know, I've heard the stories. I don't believe in the religious part. I just like their exercise. It makes me good, feel good. You know what? You're learning another language, and that other language that describes the poses comes from another religion. I don't care. You can tell me what you want. I know it's true. Amen. And you say, I can do that because I can take this out of it, but I can leave the rest of it behind. No, you can't. The enemy of God knows that. You know what breaks my heart? Churches that I've served are doing Christian yoga. You've got to be kidding me. There's no such thing. You can do Christian exercise. That's cool. But when you have to learn a new language that comes from another religion to describe what it is that you're going to do together, you have just jumped headfirst into another spirituality. You've got to put that stuff to death. And we do it all the time. It isn't just with yoga. There's a, there's a world that surrounds us that convinces us that we can just take a little bit, but we're not gonna go too far. Think about the movies you watch. What's about them? Do you wanna talk like the characters in the movies talk? Or do you say, I'm just kinda working that part out of me, and they do the talking and I don't have to. Wrong, that's what goes in, that's what's gonna come out. If not out of your actual words, it's gonna be in your mind. Do you monitor the movies that you watch? How about the people you talk to and the things that you talk about? Are the conversations that you have with your friends God honoring? Or are they life-stealing? How about what you look at at your computer screen or on your smartphone? Do you understand if it's not God-honoring, it's destroying you? See, the enemy of God knows that. Elijah knew that. Do you know that? If it isn't God-honoring, if you're not choosing to take in stuff that honors God, you're choosing to partner with the enemy of God and give him control of your mind. And if that's what's happening, it's destroying you. Do you take what goes into here as seriously as God does? If you aren't listening to what gives you a God-honoring life, then you're inviting the enemy of God to take the life that Jesus died for you to live. It's as simple as that, folks. If you're not choosing to fill your mind with things that give you a God-honoring life, then you're inviting the enemy of God to take the life that Jesus died for you to live away from you. So you go, that's eh, a little bit extreme, preacher. That's a little, I can handle it. I'm, that might be for you, but no. Let me give you an example that you can all relate to. Whether you have children of your own, whether you have family or friends that have kids, you know, there's one thing in this country that most of us take pretty seriously, and that is the minds of children, right? Around our house, we, we, we kind of got made fun of by some of our friends because our kids didn't watch TV. They didn't know the shows that the other kids knew. We were very careful about what movies they got to watch. Do you know why? Because their minds are very impressionable. They're fragile. We have to be careful with it. And if you've ever been, if you had children of your own, you've ever been asked to watch kids, you know what? You do things a little differently when there's a three-year-old around than you do when there's not, don't you? You take care of the mind and the eyes and the ears of a young child differently than you take care of yours. But I'm going to ask you the question, why? What is it that they shouldn't hear that's okay for you to hear? What is it you want to prevent them from seeing that's okay for you to see? Why is their mind fragile and need to be protected and yours doesn't? 
See, we all agree that kids' minds are fragile and we've got to be careful. But I'll tell you what, our brains are no less fragile. They're no less impressionable. The truth is that as adults, we do the same thing that children do. We mimic, we copy, we imitate, and we repeat what we see and hear, what we choose to let in, the voices that we choose to listen to. We protect children, and then we dive headfirst into the swampy garbage. If it isn't okay for a three-year-old, it maybe isn't okay for you. You can write me off as a radical, and, and that's fine. That's your choice. But here's two things I know. I know, number one, God hasn't changed, and human beings are still sheep. And all too often, we're going to follow a thing that feels good, not that is good. That we're going to do what's easy, not what's right. And the enemy of God knows that. Truth be told, we would rather listen to a preacher tell us that if we try a little harder, if we smile a little bit more, you know, you're already good people. God's going to just love you right into heaven because you're better than your neighbor. That person might have something to worry about, but you don't. There's a lot of preaching in the country that happens like that. And you know what? That kind of ear tickling is going to get a lot of preachers in trouble come judgment day. It's not my job to call them out. I'm not going to do that, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to take part of it. See, Jesus didn't give his life for our salvation so that we could get comfortable with our sin and fill our head with garbage and say, we'll filter it out later. So before you know it with old uh, Elijah here, Jezebel weighs in. Because now there's people who, who were their religious leaders that he's just killed and she's not happy about it. What she's not happy about is that her goddess Asherah has been proved just as worthless and empty as the god Baal that they've convinced all their people to believe in. And she weighs in as the voice of the king of lies and the enemy of God and the enemy of God's people. And she tells Elijah, she basically pronounces a curse on herself. And she said, you know, may the gods be ever so um, the same to me if I don't, by this time tomorrow, make my life like those of the ones you've just killed. Meaning that if I don't have you dead by this time tomorrow, then the gods can take my life. She basically curses herself. Chapter 19, verse 3, Elijah shows just how human he is just how much like you and I he is, because it says, and then he was afraid, and he rose and he ran for his life. Can you relate? See, God proved himself to Elijah. He proved himself through the voice that he came to him with, through his provision, through his faithfulness, through his miraculous power, through his presence. And all of that gathered up falls apart when Jezebel says boo. And what Elijah chooses to listen to is her voice. And so he's so scared that he runs away. He ignores the, ignores the voice of God who has been with him, provided for him, and answered him. And the only voice that he listens to is Jezebel who says boo. In the first week of this series, I talked about cortisol and dopamine and cortisol is the one that is the one the, the chemical that's released in our brain when we're running for our lives when we're scared uh, when we're angry when we get when we get paranoid and our brain loves that chemical it just puts us on guard and we love it the one that comes from compliments is dopamine and it, it doesn't hit our brain as hard it's what calms us and relaxes us it's good for us elijah's been living in a world of a good calming chemical from a good, calming God who has been there every step of the way. And Jezebel shows up and she gives one trigger of dopamine and he runs crazy scared. And the same thing happens to us. It's the one compliment, versus, or the 99 compliments versus the one negative. Which one do we focus on? The one negative. Sometimes it happens because a voice comes from somebody who feels threatened that by you doing a God-honoring thing is going to affect their life some way. Maybe they don't want to buy in to your new direction. Sometimes it comes from our own mind telling us that we don't dare. I shouldn't do that. What will people say? It's scary. It's going to cost too much. I'm not going to give that much money to the church. I'm not going to give that much money to the cause. I'm not going to help the person standing by the side of the road. I can't afford to do that. Maybe it's just simply that people will think you're crazy. Whatever the voice is, it comes all too often even from our own minds. And so even if we don't do the wrong thing, we fail to do the right thing, the God-honoring thing. And so we say, well, by doing nothing, that's better than doing something wrong. So Elijah runs. He takes off and he heads south. He stops to rest under a broom tree 
And he basically has a woe is me story with God that he would rather just be dead. It's, it's, I've, I've done all this and, and now they all want me dead and I just want to die, God. Just let me die. Let me lay here and die. So he lays down under this broom tree to sleep. Angel comes and wakes him up and there's a fresh break, baked cake of bread and water on a stone. And Elijah knows immediately where it comes from. It comes from God. And the angel says, wake up and eat. And so Elijah does, lays back down, says, I want to die. I'm going to fall asleep. Got himself in a pretty dark place. Don't want to get out of it. The angel comes again. He wakes him up. Angel wakes up Elijah. There's a fresh cake of bread and there's water. And he says, you need to eat because um, the journey's too much for you. So, so Elijah eats and, and that food carries him 40 days because he continues to run. He runs all the way to Mount Horeb even after God provides two more times. He continues to run. And he gets there and he finds a cave and he gets comfortable in the cave. And the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You ever had God say that to you? <laughs> what exactly are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you afraid of? What are you so worried about? Why does that look like such a big deal to you? So God comes to Elijah and he says, what are you doing here? Elijah's scared of this foul-mouthed, evil-spewing woman, and he runs from everything and everyone that God has ever provided for him. And he runs to this cave, and God asks, what is he doing? Elijah should be so grateful that God cares so much that he comes to him in this place that Elijah's been trying to run away and God seeks Elijah out to be in relationship with him and you've been in that place where you want God to be nowhere around but God's still right there and all that God's saying is I'm right here and he says what are you doing here and instead of Elijah saying God thank you I, I got scared for a minute that, that woman she, she kind of terrifies me a little Elijah goes on this ridiculous whiny rant and, and he starts complaining I'm the only I've done everything you've ever asked for God I've been the best believer in the world and I've done everything you've ever wanted I've gone where you wanted me to go did what you wanted me to do you know what I'm the only one left and, and everybody else out there wants to kill me I, I'm the only believer that's left on planet earth and everybody else wants to be dead no Jezebel wants him dead and all the other people God just brought back to him bunch of baloney so God says Elijah can you go stand out in the mouth of the cave I'm going to pass by so Elijah says okay so Elijah goes out to the mouth of the cave and there's a wind and I mean this is a huge wind the Bible says it's so big it takes chunks of the mountain down it knocks rocks off the mountain that fall to the ground and the Bible says but God wasn't in the wind and then the next thing happens an earthquake comes and an earthquake literally shakes the foundation of the mountain but it says God wasn't in the earthquake well that's kind of cool because you, you know um Elijah is already feeling like the ground is falling out from behind his, underneath his feet anyway. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And it says the third thing is there was a great fire. Elijah goes, okay, I know God and fire. This is, this is good, but the Bible says God wasn't in the fire. So these three huge things that everybody would have assumed this is God coming to make a statement. And God wasn't in any one of those things, the Bible says. And then what the Bible tells us, and translations differ a little bit, but what the Bible says, then came the sound of a gentle whisper. Some say the sound of deafening silence. Some say the sound of a still, small voice. The point is, when you really want to get somebody's attention, you whisper, don't you? You have a crowd full of people talking, but that person you need to talk to that you've got a relationship with, you can whisper below the hum of the crowd and they're going to hear you. Try it sometime. It works. I know that because when I was in high school, my astonishingly mediocre athletic career... You can laugh about that. It was. I'm okay with that. I've made peace. Could be a gym full of people yelling at a basketball game, and you know the two voices I could hear? My mom and dad. They're not yellers. They weren't loud. But I knew their voice above everybody else, and, and, and I could hear it like it, it came through on a loudspeaker system, but I knew it didn't. When you want to get somebody's attention, what do you do? You whisper. You lower your voice so that they lean in and they can hear. And the Bible says God came in this almost hard to hear whisper but you know the original Hebrew kind of gets at something different see we want God to speak to us and what the original Hebrew really talks about is a, a silence a crushing silence a deafening silence that it went from all the noise of the wind and the earthquake and the fire to the sound of absolutely nothing that's got Elijah's attention maybe God showed up in silence <laughs> but wait there's more I got thinking about this and why it is the discrepancy. The Hebrew word can't be that hard to understand. 
So I went back to the Jewish Bible that I have. I have a Jewish study Bible. And I said, I wonder what they say about it. What do the Jewish people actually understand this to be? And the footnote on it absolutely blew me away. Because in the footnote of the Jewish study Bible, it says this. What the ancient Hebrews understood that to be, that sound was the faintest hint. A whisper of the song of the heavenly host praising God before his arrival. What happens every time God makes an appearance on earth? Who shows up first? Angels. And what the Jewish people understood throughout history was that gentle whisper was the whisper of the heavenly host singing because God is about to pass by and Elijah being an ancient Hebrew knew it. What did God say when he began to speak? He asked Elijah again, what are you doing in the cave on top of the mountain? And Elijah, rather than saying, God, thank you for showing up, Elijah goes back to his, woe is me, I'm all alone. They're all trying to kill me. Everybody wants me dead. I alone have loved you. I'm the only one who's done what you've asked. And God says, you know, you're not the only one. Here's who else is out there. Here's how many other ones remain. And then he says to him, go. Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria and Jehu king over Israel. Oh, and then God adds a little bit later, and then anoint Elisha to be prophet in your place. God's saying, if you want out, Elijah, that's fine. You can go. Your work isn't done, but go. If you want to whine and complain, go. After everything you've seen, after all the way that I've cared for you, I've provided, protected, and done miracles because you asked, if after all that you'd rather run in fear from the empty threats of, threats of a woman, then go. And so Elijah does. He goes. And God allows you and I to do the exact same thing. If you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, if you believe in God as your father and creator, then you know better than to run, and yet we do anyway. Somebody else jumps in and says boo, and we turn tail and go. Elijah's the poster child for what happens when you listen to the wrong voices. You know where Elijah went wrong? It wasn't listening to God and following and being obedient. It was when he started listening to the voice of the enemy speaking threats through him through the voice of Jezebel. See, she had some power on her. She was a queen. She was married to the king, and he had just done something that made them mad. And so he got terrified. He gave all the power and all the authority for his life over to her, her even though she had just proved that all of the gods, small g, that they believed in were worthless. See, Elijah had been there when the God of Israel had proved himself once again to be all-powerful. And he listened to the voice of Jezebel. Instead of trusting the voice of God, the tr trusting the word of God, he gave authority to the voice of fear, the voice of threats, and the voice of death. So 2 Corinthians 4, starting in 7, and jumping forward from there, it says this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. What are the jars of clay? It's, it's your heart and mind. And what's the one thing we know about clay? It's really easily broken. You can put something of infinite value in it, and it'll be fine until you're care not careful with it. And the jars of clay shatter. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us, and I'll add, not to Jezebel, or not to whoever it is that's speaking threats into your life. We're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who has raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence so we do not lose heart. Elijah lost heart. He lost faith. He lost trust. What voices are you listening to? What's the information? What are the images that control the way you think and speak and live? Who do you give the authority to speak life or death to you? Do you listen to God and what he says about you, or do you listen to the voice of the enemy of God who wants nothing more than to take your life, to destroy you and the good work that God is doing in you? See, when God told Elijah to go, God didn't quit his work because he told him to anoint Elisha as prophet, and God continued to do what he was going to do. 
But Elijah was no longer a part of it. God let him have what he wanted. He got to go. What voice do you listen to? Are you allowing voices to help grow you as you continue the good work that God is doing in you? Or do you get f- afraid and stop what God is doing? So make no mistake, the voices you choose to listen to, the information that you fill your head with, the people you choose to trust will shape your life. Maybe you're listening to me and you say, I don't know God's voice. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, then start there. That's where it begins. Submit your life to him as your savior and accept his free gift of salvation. And then from there you accept the fact that he is not only your savior, but he is the Lord of your life. And he died to save you from your sin. Start reading the Bible because God's all over those pages. Start knowing his voice by reading his word. Spend time talking about God-honoring things with other Christians. Take time to pray. Talk to God. Listen for God's voice through the words of the Bible, the words of the other, other believers, even confirmation through your prayers of what you read and know of God's character in his word. Finally, for all of us, we've got to learn to speak God's truth to ourselves and to others out loud. Because you know what? The battlefield of the mind is the greatest battlefield that Satan has. And I can't let him take your mind or the minds of the people that you and I care about without us putting up a fight. And what's the only fight we have? It's the Word of God. It's who we are as God's people. So maybe you need help with that. I tried this uh, a few weeks ago with you. Maybe you take John 3.16 and you just turn the words a little bit. Not changing them, but personalizing them. You say, for God so loved me that he gave his only son that when I believe in him, I will not perish, but I will have eternal life. You know what? You can memorize that in about 30 seconds. You need to take captive your thoughts because the world is pushing in. Repeat that one over and over. See, Ahab Ahab thought he would win just like Satan thought he was winning by seeing Jesus hang on the cross. But the enemy of God can only pretend, can lie, doesn't have any real power and he knows it which is why he uses temptation which isn't even a real thing to cause you to do something that is real which is to sin he can't force you to do anything he can't create in you a thought you welcome the thought he's a liar he wants to separate us from our creator God alone is the truth so there's two voices that we get to choose from and everything boils down to this there's the voice of God and his truth and the voice of the enemy of God and his lies As a believer in Jesus, the enemy of God is your enemy. He wants you separated out from other believers so that you're easy to prey on. Because there's wolves that surround us, and if he can get one sheep to step away from the rest of the flock, that sheep is easy pickings. Which is why we need to be Christians in community together. The enemy of God wants to separate you away, but what God wants is to speak life and love and forgiveness and peace to you. He wants to speak his truth to you. Who are you going to listen to? That's the question. Who are you going to listen to? Let's pray. God, thank you for the story of Elijah. Thank you for the passages for his time in history that we get to read about. God, uh, as much as he was a superhero of faith, man, he just really goofed things up. We can relate to that. God, be real to us. Help us to choose you. Help us to choose thoughts that honor you and that that grow our relationship with you. Help us to honestly recognize the things that we choose to let into our minds that we know are not of you. Because those things are only going to kill us. They're going to separate us further. They're going to give us reasons to leave church and leave Christian friends. God, help us to hear you, to hear your voice, to hear your voice of truth. And then help us to trust it through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.